It's my honor to introduce our special guest speaker, Chief Tracy Kajawa. Chief Kajawa has been in the fire service since 1992. She began her career working for the Stevens Point Fire. She started as a firefighter and served in many positions prior to becoming the chief of the Stevens Point Fire in 2012. Tracy was appointed the chief of the city of Wausau Fire Department in 2014. Since becoming part of the Wausau Fire Department in May of 2014, Chief Kajawa has been elected to the position of trustee for the Wisconsin State Fire Chiefs Association. She is also on the steering committee for Critical Incident Stress CIS Services of Wausau and a member of the, the North Central Technical College Emergency Medical Services Advisory. Chief Kajawa education and training include a Master of Science in Public Safety Administration from Lucas University and a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Wisconsin Students College. She also is a licensed nationally registered paramedic and certified as a hazardous materials technician instructor to fire inspector and safety and fire safety officer. Chief Kajawa has also attended numerous federal emergency management agency and national fire academy courses. Chief Kajawa and her husband Jack, of 38 years, have raised three awesome children we have just talked about. <laughs> and now enjoy five beautiful grandchildren. We're honored to have her here with us today as she presents leadership principles that can make all the difference. Please help me welcome Chief Tracy Kajawa. I didn't, I didn't think about leadership. 
the philosophical concept of leadership. I thought leadership was simply gaining a position of authority. I guess I didn't think it was very, really that important. And I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit to that. And I actually thought I was a coordinator as well. I hate to even admit that as well. I was pretty naive. And then it became very clear to me how important it was. Fortunately, I was accepted enough to understand that I was failing, number one. And secondly, I didn't like that I was failing. So I began to study the reasons why, and everything pointed back to my last position. I know now that leadership has changed my life and how impactful it's been. And I just hope that today we are able to, to grow more confident in what leadership looks like for each of us individually and become more knowledgeable as to how we can lead those around us more effectively. I do wish somebody would have spoken to me about leadership when I was younger and exposed me to the positive aspects of developing leadership qualities. But because of this, every new firefighter we hire at Wausau Fire Department, myself, and my leadership staff sit down for more than an hour on their first morning at our department and talk about expectations, we talk about our mission and our core values, and we talk about leadership. Because we want our young people, our 19, 20, 21 year olds, we want them to start looking at what leadership looks like for them. We want them to be leaders in our department. My first three tests of leadership, which I just spoke about failing in, was when I was promoted to deputy chief on shift. This unfortunately was about 14 years into my career. So I was in charge of 12 guys at the Cedar Point Fire Department. Most of those years, I worked with these guys. They're like brothers to me. I went from being a complainer to the one they complained about. <laughs> my, my job is to be the leader of the crew, direct on the day of the operation and tasks, be the incident commander at the big scenes like fighters and car crash and mass casualty incidents. Doesn't sound all that difficult, but it sure was difficult for me. As I stated earlier, I made the mistake of thinking that I was a born leader. I came to this conclusion simply because, well, I was a bad maybe in high school and college. I bet I was good. I was good at it. I was smart. I went to college. I had a degree. Well, these were all great experiences, but they didn't help me in my ability to be to lead people. I know now there is no such thing as a board leader. Thank goodness. Leadership is hard work. Every day, Of what didn't work. And then to try to implement the strategy to improve upon my failures. That's every day for me. I live here in Portage County. I commute from Wausau and I have a 45 minute drive home. And if I'm not trying to stay awake on my drive home, I sit here and I try to analyze my day and try to figure out what actually went great that day and maybe what didn't go that great, great that day. And I try to philosophically look at how I can be better at what I do. You know, the joke in the fire service is you put this white shirt on, which is the color of the shirt that the designated leaders within our department wear, and the brain disappears. You know, the line guys have a lot of fun with that, but I think there is some truth to this. Because many people like me who move into leadership positions from the line don't know what leadership is. So we resort to emulating what we have seen or experienced from individuals that filled that position previously, which most often is more managerial in nature, not leadership in nature. How many of you can say you work for a good leader? And maybe I shouldn't even ask this, because you might have your boss here today. I'll take that back. Mayor Reeves, I know you have your boss here today. So just think about, you know, how many of you can say you work for a good leader? 
the fire service is a paramilitary organization and we have put very little effort into growing leaders until about the last decade, maybe a bit longer. I know I have very few good leaders, role models in, in, my, in my career so far. The joke in the fire service, 100 years of tradition, unimpeded by progress. Tradition is easy, comfortable, change is non-existent. We do things because the way, that's the way it's always been done. Does this sound like your organization? It is difficult sometimes to break, break that mindset, but it's, an, it's imperative for the fire service and all organizations that we, are, we aren't content with status quo and with good leadership, positive change will happen. I guess you could say I learned what leadership was by experiencing firsthand what it wasn't. As I alluded to before, I had some bosses that weren't all that great. The weird thing is that I didn't even realize it, that at, ta at the time I didn't even realize it. I knew I didn't really like working for the guy, but truly didn't associate this feeling with his inability to lead until I became a leader and began to analyze and evaluate, evaluate my formative years. I then realized that the actions and behaviors I was exposed to when I was younger were those that I didn't want to emulate. So maybe this is elementary, but I'm, I'm gonna ask another question and I don't expect a response, I guess, but what is leadership? What does leadership look like? You know, there's many definitions to leadership. Some might define it as a capacity to, to transform vision into reality. Those who empower others, when everyone else feels in charge. Don Max, Maxwell's simple definition, and I, I really appreciate Don Maxwell's view on leadership, defines it simply as influence. And another definition is getting a large group of people to work together toward a common goal. Getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. These are just a few definitions of leadership. I think the point is that in order for leaders to actually accomplish any of these definitions, they have to be able to have the character traits that motivate people to improve their performance so that it has a direct effect on the advancement of the organization. You know, there's a difference between management versus leadership, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Managers do things right, leaders do the right thing. Managers do things right, leaders do the right thing. So managers are responsible for things like money, budgeting, IT, advertising, resources, different inventories, whereas leadership involves leading a group of people. Managers manage things, Leaders lead people. There certainly is a need for management within an organization. Growing and achieving organizations need good managers. Leaders need good managers for their success as well. But when it comes to people, people don't like to be managed. We need to remember, we manage things, we lead people. So how do we have influence? How do we empower others? How do we motivate people? How do we simply, how do we lead instead of simply manage? As I said before, I had to grow a bunch. And I was old when I started doing this. I was, I was in my mid to late 30s before I started investing time and effort into my leadership. And then I read anything I could, and everything I could get my hands on. And we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. But in that growth, and, and my, in my evaluation of that growth, there's five different principles and there's simple principles that, that have been, that I'm gonna outline here that helped me through those struggles in my growth. It helped me advance my abilities in the area of leadership and they helped me to motivate people and empower people. And I just wanna talk about these five principles. The first principle, know who you are, know yourself. And, and you can think about this. How many of you truly believe you know yourself? I know myself now, but before I started studying leadership, I avoided that whole mess. It was way too much work. 
self-reflection, self-evaluation, trying to figure out uh, contemplation. It was way too but much work for me to sit down and actually figure out who I was. I'll be honest, I think I knew myself better when I was younger as compared to when I was moving into adulthood or even when I was an adult. I had clear aspirations as a child, along with desires and dreams, albeit they were simple and innocent, but because of the simplicity and innocence, there was much less minutia to consider. Obviously, as we grow older, we have more experiences, both positive and negative, that affect who we are and our behaviors, so we become more, more complex. So when I was young, I was a tomboy, which was in direct conflict with what my mother desired, which was a daughter that acted like a girl. And I had four brothers, so I was the only girl. There was a lot of pressure on me to be a girl. Yes, I failed miserably. I guess that would be a normal expectation from a mother, right? A daughter, I want a girl. Throughout my childhood and years, my mother continually, continually tried to influence me subliminally by painting my room pink. She bought me a beautiful pink canopy bed. I'd like to have it today, not so much when I was growing up. She made me wear a skirt or a dress to school three days a week. It was tough playing King on the Hill and football in a dress. I snuck sweatpants to school in my backpack. She found out about that later on. She was not happy with me. She made me take home economics until I started failing and then she let me go into industrial arts. And those were the old names. I don't even know what they call them now. But I'm sure there's a different name. What was interesting is what my mother defined as a girl and what I thought represented a girl was on opposite ends of the spectrum, but it didn't faze me. I knew who I was. And I really liked who I was. I was not intimidated by what others thought. I did what I enjoyed doing, even if it was, if it was unpopular or not normal. I was comfortable wearing painted jeans and combat boots. I, I liked playing football at recess, even though all the girls in my class made fun of me. I didn't have the same innocent confidence as I got older. I wavered a lot, depending on who I was with or where I was, I was a different person in a different situation. I didn't like that. I get it, there's a lot more going on as we get older and we begin maturing, but I guess the point is that I needed to figure out who I was again. I lost my identity. So the way I went about going, the way I went going about that was by identifying my weaknesses and my strengths. This is important to know not only to determine who you are, but who you are as a leader. You have to be truly honest with yourself. You might even need to ask some of your closest friends or relatives. How do you show that weaknesses, the weaknesses we possess, even with hard work, can never become strengths. And because strengths are much easier to enhance, it is recommended that we try to get our strengths to the superior level. We need to capitalize on our strengths and bring our weaknesses to the mediocrity level so they are not so obvious. That's why we need to know our strengths and our weaknesses. We shouldn't concentrate or be fixated on the areas we need, we need development in because humanistically, that is what we tend to do. Think about it, when we get an employee evaluation, what do we want to know most in that evaluation? Areas of needed improvement. Where are our shortfalls? We don't dwell on the positive aspects of that report, only on the improvement areas, most often. We can't take for granted our strengths as well. Don't just allow yourself to maintain status quo with your strengths. As I stated before, we need to be conscious of what our strengths are and continue to grow them and make them more powerful. But we can't overuse or abuse our strengths or they can become very negative. For example, we can all agree that confidence is probably a positive strength, but if that trait is abused, it turns into arrogance. It turns into people that are, are superior, egotistical, maybe some haughtiness, all of which are, are unattractive. We also need to know our strengths and weaknesses because as leaders, we should surround ourselves with individuals that complement our weaknesses. Great leaders find a way to surround themselves 
with people to fill the gaps. I try to hire people who are good at things that I'm not the best at. This is so, there is so much to be gained through mutual support and leadership positions. Knowing yourself also requires us to figure out our behavioral weaknesses, our emotional triggers, categorizing our personal traits as, as, strength, as strong or weak is difficult in and of itself, but knowing our behaviors, that's even more complex. What triggers our emotions? We have to be brutally honest with ourselves. That's not very fun either. An emotional trigger is any topic that makes us feel uncomfortable, and it varies from person to person. When this occurs, we need to be able to control our response as leaders. It's all about elevating our emotional, test, our emotional intelligence. As leaders, we should have a high level of emotional intelligence. When I was trying to assess this in myself, it took a lot of self-reflection. We need to know our blind spots. I found and made excuses for my behavior, and I would not admit to my poor behavior until I sought out, sought out some honest input from those who were closest to me and that I trusted. I think we can all admit that when we have behaved poorly or inappropriately, we kind of feel bad about the experience. We kind of second guess it and say, well, I, I wish I would have been better. Well, I would get that feeling, but then I would proceed to blame others or I'd blame the situation or anything else for that matter, but I wouldn't take accountability for it. When getting others involved and seeking out their honest opinion, it becomes really transparent. What I found out was, I thought I was much better than I really was. I turned a blind eye to many of my bad behaviors and certainly the behaviors that are becoming of a leader. We need to replace these bad behaviors with good behaviors and good reactions. This is, a, this is tough because bad habits are hard to break. It is what we know, it is who we are. And it's the behavior we resort to when we're under stress or when we find ourselves in uncomfortable positions. Just remember, wisdom comes with knowing who you are. I could give several examples of this if I had another hour, but I, I don't have that hour. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to figure out those emotional triggers and it's difficult to change them. But in order to elevate our emotional life, emotional intelligence, it's so important that we figure out what that looks like. Principle book number two, care about those you lead. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Treat others the way they want, they want to be treated. For me, this is gaining mutual respect. Being a leader, we want to be viewed as knowing what we are doing. We want our people to have confidence in our decisions in the direction of the organization. And through genuine caring, we as leaders can make those around us feel they are part of the team and they are valued. You know, on the surface, this doesn't seem really that tough, right? But I think we can all agree that is, there is, on occasion, those one or two people that really try us, right? It makes this principle very difficult to apply. As leaders, we need to show all those we work with that we care for them, with no exception, even those we find difficult. I will find time to spend with these people so I can figure out what makes them sick, what's important to them, make them feel valued, and their behavioral changes. This is time well spent, it is good for the health of not only that person, but also for myself and for the health of the organization as a whole. This type of behavior can be contagious. Think about it. If those in the organization see that leaders care, they are more likely to care as well. This type of attitude ultimately moves the organization in a huge and positive direction. I want all my firefighters to feel I care for them not only for the reciprocal effect, but because it's the right thing to do. Also remember, words are powerful. We must always use our words wisely. We need to think before we speak, because poorly chosen words are never forgotten. 
My children still remind me of my four children were when they were growing up. There were eight. My oldest son is 37. He still reminds me. And if you have young kids, it's coming. You'll get it too. Another way you can show you care is through being a good listener. Listening is an art, and most people can't do it well. We are too busy thinking what we want to say in response or to add to the conversation, which jeopardizes our ability to truly listen. We shouldn't listen with the intent to reply, but with the intent to understand. To be truly successful, we need to do more listening and less talking. And if you ask my guys at the firehouse, I really need to work on that because I do talk a lot. Principle number three is to be humble. We can't be full of ourselves. Pride is really a spiritual cancer. Pride is concerned with who's right. Humility is concerned with what is, with, with what is right. Ultimately, we as leaders don't ever want to jeopardize doing the right thing because we want to be right. We can't have respect for others or their opin opinions without humility. I think we all know those individuals that are outwardly prideful. With this trait comes more unbecoming traits such as being hypercritical, being disrespectful, maybe being a little egocentric, overconfident. Although we might think we are not prideful, we can be pretty good at hiding pride or denying it. I did that for a long, long time. It can occupy our being without us even realizing it. For example, not being able to take constructive criticism is a sign of pridefulness. I was horrible at taking constructive criticism. I've learned and it's been a tough lesson to listen to understand, digest, and then decide if the criticism offered is genuine and sincere. I don't lash out at people that come to me and offer their advice to me any longer. I change who I am if I know that they're right. To get better as leaders, we must be open to constructive criticism and respect, be respectful of it. This is a tough question, because this is a really tough one for me. Have you ever been critical of others or judgmental? Finding, finding fault or flaws in them and ultimately arriving at an unfair assessment? Sometimes without even knowing the entire truth of the situation, we come to a conclusion. Then me personally, I proceeded to talk totally about them and maybe even pass some rumors or gossip about them. This is an issue in the fire service as a whole. Prideful people want to elevate themselves above others because it makes us feel good. Humanistically, that makes us feel good. But this is really destructive behavior. I've learned to empathize with the plight of others and not to elevate myself on a pedestal because that fall off that pedestal, pedestal was hurtful. You know, I've done this, I've mentioned that before, and that is, this is pride. What about being concerned about our outward appearance as opposed to our inner being? Striving to put together on the outside and not being concerned about what comes out of our mouths or how we treat others. You know, I've done this too, and I'm working on changing that. Not being able to say thank you in gratitude by our very close friends. We as leaders need to show gratitude consistently without hesitation. It's important for our well being, and a sincere thank you is so meaningful to the recipient of that appreciation. I make an effort every day to make sure I say thank you to at least two or three people. And it's an effort because lots of times we don't even think about thanking people. So whether pride is outwardly evident or inwardly captive, I can't emphasize enough how destructive pride can be. It is such a strong humanistic trait and we are so blinded by it sometimes. 
And even after we finally admit to being afflicted, it is so difficult to rid ourselves of this. But great leaders find a way to accomplish this, and in that, begin to value others above themselves. This is what I strive for. And sometimes, some days, it's very, very difficult. Remember, pride is behind all lack of love, all indifference to the needs of others, their feelings, their weaknesses. It is a source of hasty judgments and feelings of unforgiveness and bitterness. Pride is behind all of that. So principle number four is attitude. Attitude is defined as a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. I can't talk enough about attitude, probably because I know firsthand the consequences of a bad one. Sometimes we're even oblivious to a bad attitude. I know I was. I remember about 20 years ago, and Nikki and I were talking about this. I got myself an attitude adjustment. I didn't even ask for it. At the time, I was in fire service for maybe seven or eight years. I worked my normal 24 hour shift and I was arri arriving home when my oldest son, Josh, was just leaving for school. He was about 16 or so. Just to set the stage, my son, Josh, was and still is one of the most considerate people I know. I remember walking in and saying something to him. I don't actually remember what, what it was and, and neither does he. And it's, it's probably selective remembrance. Probably don't want to remember. But afterwards, I realized by his reaction, it was obvious it was hurtful to him. He initially walked by me without saying a word. And when he got closer to the door, we just happened to turn around and I remember getting eye contact with him. Then the words came out of his mouth. Mom, why are you such an idiot? It's so tough to be around you. He didn't say it that nice, really. After he said his piece, he hurriedly rushed out of the house, and lucky thing he did. I don't know if there would have been physical harm, but it probably would have said something that I regretted. So my initial reaction to this comment was, how dare him? Wait until he gets home from school. I'll get a hold of him. But after that shock, and anger began to wear off, and it took a couple hours, I started to think about what, what he just said what I had been going through. And I did realize that my life had, had, had taken a turn somewhere and my attitude had changed so drastically that it actually evolved into being an idiot without even realizing it. I sat down and at that point all I could do was cry. Obviously, if I did this to my son, how many other people have I treated poorly because of my attitude? I mean, I was hired at the fire department to serve my community, and my son is calling me an idiot, right? So many things crossed my mind. After an hour or two, I moved into that denial stage. So I called my bestie at the fire department and asked him, hey, have I been an idiot lately? Well, his comment was, how'd you find out? Yes, you've been. <laughs> Yes, you've been a blank, you blank, blank, blank. I can't even repeat what he said. I asked him why he didn't, why he didn't say something. His response was, there's no way I was getting, getting into it with you. Now him and I have a pact, and I, I've since left Stephen's point. But we had a pact until I left Stephen's point. If we ever saw that change in us, and I have a feeling it was probably due to compassion fatigue, now we have a definition for it, that I really had an attitude problem. That we would help each other out and we would identify to each other and we wouldn't strain each other and we'd be able to take that constructive criticism. I'm not sure what got me, I, I, actually I, I do know what got me to that point. Like I said, it was compassion fatigue. But at, at this point in time, I never want to go back to that. So now every morning I wake up, I check my attitude. If I have a bad one, I don't even get out of bed until I have a good one. Sometimes it takes me a while. Depending on what my day looks like, 
depending on the stresses of the day. This morning I had a bad one. I was stressed out about this, right? So I lay in bed and I coach myself into having a good attitude. Because I know being a leader within my organization and your organization, my attitude is infectious. And so every day, I'm responsible to show up with a great attitude. My, my people deserve that. Remember, your attitude belongs to you. So if you choose to have a good one, no one will be able to take it away from you. Principle number five, have a vision with action. So vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes time. Vision with action can change the world. So we want to have vision with action. This is a true statement. Did I say something there, Regan? <laughs> oh, that's okay. If you win a prize, I'll get it. <laughs> okay, no, no, we won't. No, we won't. You, you, you still owe me lunch. Thank you for coming, by the way. So the vision with action can change the world. This is a true statement. It reminds me every day that we have to live with intentionality. We have to set goals for ourselves or we'll, we will remain stagnant in our efforts. How many of you have personal mission statements and core values? The first time I heard this, I thought, come on, really? This is only 10 years ago. Really, personal mission statement, core values? What's that gonna do for me? Well, I created one about a decade ago. It's made all the difference in the world. A personal mission statement is just like a mission statement for your organization, except it's for you personally. My mission statement assists me in making decisions every single day. It helps me stay on track. I'm able to prioritize appropriately. My core values help me in my behavior and my actions. It helps me with my attitude. If you don't have a personal mission statement and associated core values, I encourage you to move in that direction. Every day, I can check my pro progress against my mission and my, my behavior with my core values. I think it's important to mention something about fear as well. Because with change and growth, fear is always lurking. Fear can be paralyzing and will keep us from accomplishing our goals and making our life meaningful. Don't let fear keep you from your destiny. Own your feelings and let fear walk away. Always ask yourself, am I aspiring high enough? Don't limit yourself. Words and thoughts are powerful, like I said before. You need to think about greatness and excellence because that is how you will aspire to a higher level and your organization will aspire to a higher level because they'll follow their leader. They'll become the best that they can be because you set that example. So the five principles, know who you are, care about those you need, be humble, not prideful, check your attitude all the time, have vision with action. You know, I know that everyone here has probably been exposed to some, if not all, of what we've just talked about. But if you're like me, sometimes we need reminders of what these things look like. And it's a good review. We need to continually analyze where we are and where we need to go to get better. We need to study leadership. We need to figure out who we are so we can excel. I'm hopeful that you were able to take something away from today's discussion. And again, I so appreciate you being here today and spending time uh, on leadership because I know your, your time is so valuable. Uh, so thank you so much for having me and, and actually listening. Thank you.